So hello, I'm Lucy. Um, I'm one of the RadNet Early Career Fellows. Um, I focus particularly on the role of radiation and cell fate um, and the role of the microenvironment in glioblastoma. Um, so welcome to this month's RadNet seminar. Uh, the series is really intended to uh, initiate connectivity, to give insight into new radiation research developments, both clinical and non-clinical, um, and offer the opportunity to build expertise and to hopefully foster new collaborations. Um, and before I introduce our speaker for today, can I just go over some of the housekeeping points? So can everyone please mute your microphones and turn off your cameras during the talk? Um, you can turn your camera on at the end um, if you want to ask a question. Um, and if you do want to ask a question, can you please post the comments in the chat or raise your hand and I will get to these when we're um, doing the question and answer. The meeting will be recorded um, and you can access the recordings via the CIUK RADNET website, um, the details of which are shown below. And you can also follow CIUK City of London RADNET uh, using the Twitter handle below as well. So um, it's my absolute pleasure today to um, welcome our speaker, Professor Rol Uh Rol is a Professor and Associate Director of the Jackson Laboratory for Genomic Medicine in Farmington, Connecticut. His lab focuses on using glia, um, gen genomic characterization and computational analyses, and in doing so, has really helped to redefine the way that adult uh, um, patient, uh, the way glioma is in adult patients is classified. So, more recently, they focused on tumor, tumor evolution, which the lab is investigating using longitudinal tumor sequencing, single cell sequencing, and via comparative uh, oncology approaches. Uh, Roll is a recipient of the AAAS uh, Watchtel Award, the Agilent Early Career Professor Award, and the Peter Steck Memorial Award. He is also co-founder of Boundless Bio, a biotech company developing therapies against cancers containing extra chromosomal DNA amplifications. So without further ado, um, I will hand over now to Roll, who's going to tell us about treatment-induced genomic scars through longitudinal profiling of glioma. So I'll stop sharing my screen. No. And the floor is yours, Rob. All right. Well, thank you for that introduction. And um, it's my pleasure to be here today. The technical issues were on my side, so I apologize for that. Um, so let me get underway here. So first, my disclosures. Uh, I'm a, a co-founder of a company called Boundless Bio, and I'm a consultant for Stella Nova Therapeutics, but I don't believe that impacts the results that I'm presenting today. So as mentioned, I'm a, uh, an employee of the Jackson Laboratory. Uh, some of you may know it because you've ordered mice there. Uh, we have a big and blooming mouse business up in um, Bar Harbor, Maine. Um, I work at the Connecticut campus, and as an entity, we are a nonprofit research institution. So uh, Peter Knoll in 19, 1976 um, sort of coined the term tumor evolution and proposed that tumor cells acquire genomic abnormalities and that, this, and that these genomic abnormalities provide cells with competitive advantages, thereby spurring the development of an evolutionary process, really revolutionary at the time and now widely accepted. Um, so that means that, at the, uh, that from the, the, the time of the first cancer cell, the cell of origin, to the time of diagnosis, there's a uh, evolutionary process that drives the, the, um, the formation of a polyclonal tumor. And that by the time of diagnosis, uh, most tumors are in fact polyclonal, meaning that uh, there's different sets of cells that have slightly different sets of genomic uh, abnormalities. And of course, projects like the Cancer Genome Atlas have widely uh, characterized um, these, uh, this and shown that this is in fact the case. Um, now the tumor type that I'm going to focus on, that my lab large, by and large focuses on, is adult glioma. And the genomic landscape of primary adult and uh, glioma and glioblastoma have been very well characterized um, by the Cancer Genome Atlas, and I was a part of that uh, during my time, um, uh, but also by many other groups, including the, Vo the Vogelstein lab and, and um, uh, for example, groups in Japan. All that molecular profiling has told us a few things about glioma, amongst others that um, we can identify three molecular glioma subtypes. Traditionally, the uh, classification of glioma was done on the basis of histopathology, but increasingly we're recognizing that molecular markers are a better tool for um, clinical grouping of uh, glioma patients. 
So the three molecular glioma subtypes that have been defined are from left to right, the 1P19Q co-deleted IDH mutant subtype, the non-co-deleted IDH mutant subtype, and the IDH wild type um, group of tumors. And this was first, um, I think, first coined in, the, in this New England Journal, a New England Journal paper by the TCGA. Now, what is important to recognize is that, first of all, these groups are defined on the basis of two you know, relatively uh, well-established and simple markers that can be determined using immunohistochemistry or FISH. And so, so, so assays that are widely available in most uh, uh, pathology, uh, pathology labs. But uh, what is important to recognize here is that these groups are not just different because of those two markers, but that there's many other uh, abnormalities that coincide with them. And so, as such, they really define uh, biologically different subtypes. For example, the 1P19Q co-deleted tumor, which of course refers to the, the deletion of the 1P arm and the 19Q are chromosome arms, um, is further characterized by a frequent presence of, for example, third promoter. Uh, let me see if I can get a mouse going here somewhere. Oh yeah, here, hold on. Um, it's further, uh, um, characterized by, the, by an omnipresence of third promoter mutations. Uh, CIC mutations and FUBP1 mutations are also frequent in this tumor type. In contrast, the non-codeleted tumors, uh, which are still also IDH mutant, uh, very sparsely uh, carry third promoter mutations, but are characterized by ATRX mutations, which, you know, ATRX is a gene, its function is in part to regulate uh, alternative lengthening of telomeres. So the third promoter mutation that's present in the 1P9 group 19Q co-deletions has been um, uh, converted to ATRX mutations in the non-codels. Also, P53 mutations are highly frequent uh, in this subset, whereas they are mostly absent in the 1P19Q co-deleted tumors. And then finally, IDH wild type tumors are different altogether. They have some P53, some ATRX, but not very many. Also, not very many CIC or FUBP1 mutations, but they have very frequent P10 loss, EGFR amplification and mutation. And there's many other genes in this stuff that are not shown in this particular graph, uh, like P16 deletion, which is detected in uh, homozygous deletion, which is detected in over 60% of IDH wild type gliomas. I mean, and finally, this tumor, this uh, glioma subtype also has very frequent presence of third promoter mutations. So I think this is important to know that uh, these are biologically very different, different entities. As I mentioned, these subtypes are defined on the basis of two molecular markers, IDH mutation and, one, and loss of 1P90Q. Um, and the reason that they are now the basis for the current classification by the World Health Organization is that they also strongly uh, confer a different survival pattern with the IDH mutant, uh, sorry, the IDH wild type tumors having particularly poor survival. And that's because this group by and large coincides with what we used to call glioblastomas, or you know, we still call them glioblastomas. Um, all IDH wild type tumors are now referred to as glioblastomas, regardless of grade. Then the lower grade gliomas, which are the IDH mutants, um, show much more favorable survival. I do think it's important to realize that patients that are um, diagnosed in this group are typically diagnosed at much younger age than the IDH wild type tumors the glioblastomas. Um, typically, the age of a diagnosis of IDH mutant gliomas is about 40 to 45 versus about 60 for IDH mutant wild type tumors, meaning that overall there's really no, no, no favorable subtype of any sort here because IDH mutant tumor patients will die at a younger age than glioblastoma patients on average. So these are really just very, very bad tumors and we really have very limited tools to do anything about that. Now, clinically, what are, uh, how are these patients treated? Um, the standard of care for patients with an IDH wild type glioma, again, those are the glioblastoma patients, combines, combines the bulking surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation. The bulking surgery is typically the first, the very first step of treatment, and um, chemotherapy the next. Um, chemotherapy is not very effective. Uh, it gives an average, I believe, a six week uh, benefit. Um, but the comorbidity of chemotherapy is relatively minimal. Then there's radiation, which is more effective. Uh, I think the ad added, advantage is, added advantage is about three months, um, but radiation also derives much more uh, comorbidity. 
um, uh, and is therefore, even though it's part of the standard of, of care for glioblastoma patients, for lower grade glioma patients, the IDH mutant patients, uh, this is not necessarily the first step in treatment, the second step in treatment. So there's no standard of care for patients with an IDH mutant glioma. Now, I started off by saying that um, uh, tumors are evolving and that by the time of diagnosis, the um, tumor will be most, uh, the majority of tumors, if not all tumors, are polyclonal in, in some way or shape or form. Now, that evolutionary process doesn't stop at the time of diagnosis. And as I mentioned, we know quite a bit about tumor evolution and the polyclonal polyclonal nature of gliomas and many other tumor types because of TCGA and peacock and other efforts. But we have almost no understanding of what happens post-diagnosis. What is the impact of those treatments that we commonly use on the tumor? And what is actually the, 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 the tumor evolution um, behavior in absence of any treatments? Here's an example of just one patient that had a distantly recurring glioblastoma, an IDH wild type tumor. Uh, that also has an evolving genome. So you can see the timeline of this particular patient, and this is a very common timeline for a glioblastoma patient, diagnosis and then treatment with um, uh, radiotherapy and temozolomide and then more temozolomide, um, and then a recurrence after about five months. And in this case, the recurrence hap happened in a distant location. Um, uh, so you can see that the tumor sort of traversed through the front frontal lobe uh, to the to, so to what to what is here the, the right on this figure, and then the tumor the patient received another round of radio chemo, uh, chemo radiation, um, that helped a bit more. And after eight months, there was a second recurrence. Again, the tumor seems to have traveled a little bit through that brain cavity, through the cranium, um, and the patient was provided more radiation. In particular, uh, and after about 15 and a half months, the patient passed away of disease. Now. Our collaborators obtained specimens from each of those uh, recur uh, each of those time points, and as you can see, at initial diagnosis, this tumor had a a copy number DNA copy number profile that's typical for a a primary glioblastoma with a loss of chromosome 10, um, and actually a slight gain of chromosome 7 and some other gains and losses as well. Now, at the first recurrence, I think you can appreciate that the tumor has already acquired quite a bit more quite a few more abnormalities. If you look at the small number here, it's a little small, but um, you can see that there's an increase in the, in the fraction of enupoidy, so the, 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 part, the fraction, the proportion of the genome that's abnormal from 30, 0.31 to about 0.45. So the tumor is acquiring new abnormalities and presumably those new abnormalities have played some role in the, in the ability of the tumor to uh, travel through um, to migrate through the brain, but also to evade toxic effects of, of the treatment. And if you look at the second recurrence, the uh, fraction of aneuploidy uh, is very high now, 0.83. Um, and you can clearly appreciate, the, clearly see this if you look at the copy number profile. This, so this tumor keeps evolving and keeps changing. And those changes are what uh, is driving the progression of this particular tumor. So because we understand so very little of this process, in 2015, at the sort of back heels of the Cancer Genome Atlas, which wrapped up in 2014, if you think about it, um, we initiated the GLASS consortium, the Glioma Longitudinal Analysis Consortium, with the goal, the aim of creating a molecular map of glioma evolution. And we decided to do that by, by generating a comprehensive molecular reference data set from pairs of primary and recurrent glioma with clinical annotation. So what we try to do is obtain tumor specimens or sequencing data sets from time of diagnosis, but then again, from the same patient at time of recurrence. And if there was a second recurrence, we of course try to get that second recurrence and, as well and so forth. And the reason for pursuing this in a consortium setting is because it's often logistically challenging to get these specimens uh, over multiple time points. Uh, if you go to, a, a tumor bank in, in a large institution. Our experience was, and this is this includes large institutions like MD Anderson Cancer Center, uh, UCSF, and and so forth, that there are um, in that tumor bank you'll find specimens from the same patient collected at multiple time points, but not very many. In fact, at MD Anderson we could only find about uh, three dozen at the time of start. Um, 
So this was a reason to do this in a collaboration uh, setting. And because our, our, our ultimate goal is to get such data sets for 500 IDH wild type tumors, 500 IDH mutant without a co-deletion, and another 500 for um, IDH mutant with co-deletion. So we started uh, about six years ago, and um, uh, we have made some progress, although it's been certainly a very challenging uh, um, challenging, but at the same time rewarding uh, consortium to work with. So at the current time, uh, we have a glass data resource. This is our second data release, and it was released last month. And at the current time, there's a cohort of 292 patients with multiple time point DNA and or RNA sequencing data that we have established. And we've released these, these data to the public domain. Um, again, this is our second release. We've released the first release. Uh, we shared our first release in 2019. So we are approximately at a two year cycle at this point. And all this data, uh, DNA variants and RNA uh, transcription profiles can be found together with clinical annotation of these 292 patients at this URL, so synapse.org slash class. Um, without any restrictions, um, I think you need to approve the, um, the terms of use of the data, but that's it. Um, so this data set, which we hope is broadly useful, uh, consists of a majority IDH wild type tumors, um, we, but we are working hard and diligently to um, add IDH mutant non-codels and, and IDH mutant codels. And in fact, uh, the GLASS consortium is on a almost um, uh, uh, exponential scale at the moment where it took a little bit of time to get this momentum. And I think getting three data from three, nearly 300 patients with multiple time points is certainly a, uh, an excellent outcome so far, but we are expecting to dramatically increase these um, numbers in the next three to five years. Um, importantly, so we have more IDH wild types than we have IDH mutants. And this is in part determined by the relatively short time to, um, progression that uh, uh, exists for IDH wild type tumors. This makes, makes the logistical challenge uh, uh, um, less and there gives a higher chance, a higher opportunity to have multiple specimens of the same patient in the tumor banks. Um, again, we are working to, to fill the gaps here uh, and I, I suspect that we will be able to do that. Another thing to note is that we have a bias in our data set towards slightly younger patients. So you can see that the average age at diagnosis is about 54 months, uh, sorry, 54 years, whereas a common IDH wild type patient is typically about 60. Uh, and we have certainly a little bit better survival. And this ties into the fact that we need to have two surgeries, two surgical procedures uh, for patients to be able to be included. And uh, only the better performing patients will undergo that second surgery and that third surgery and so forth. Um, other things to notice that we have uh, very high rates of uh, tamazolamide treatment amongst our cohort. We have um, near complete annotation on whether a patient received tamazolamide, yes or no. Um, and then we have uh, somewhat less, uh, we have near complete radiation treatment uh, for the IDH wild type tumors and as expected, a little bit um, less frequent amongst IDH mutants. So we then started to analyze these data sets that we have collected, uh, starting by trying to understand what is the impact of the various treatments that glioma patients typically receive on the genome. And we started by evaluating temozolomide, which is a commonly used chemotherapy for gliomas. And with the knowledge that temozolomide is a de-alkylating agent, which means that it removes a methyl group, and this effect, this renders the DNA um, vulnerable to uh, DNA repair, that's actually a faulty DNA repair. And because of this faulty DNA repair, uh, there's a chance that there's an induction of C to T changes in nucleotides. Now C to T changes in nucleotides can be identified by sequencing and they're you know, known as permutations. So we evaluated the, uh, basically the burden, the frequency of permutations over time and uh, separating um, and under consideration of whether the patient received temozolomide, yes or no. So in this first analysis, and this was led by Flores Bartel and Kevin Johnson, uh, Flores is now a assistant professor at TGen in Arizona, and Kevin is a research scientist in the lab. Um, we uh, first looked at uh, IDH mutant tumors with co-deletion, and you can quickly appreciate uh, when you look at the initial um, 
mutational burden versus the, the mutational burden in the recurrent tumor, that there is a subset of patients that are hypermutated. So this is a log scale. So amongst uh, this uh, subset of our cohort, we have a number of patients with more than 10 mutations per megabase across the genome. Um, we also identified such, such cases amongst the other two uh, glioma subtypes, the non-codels and the IDH wild types. And in each of those cases, we know that these patients received tamazolamide, and the tamazolamide um, is the reason that this hypermutation occurred. And what we also, what we then were able to find is that the frequency of uh, hypermutation is higher amongst IDH mutants compared to IDH wild types. This potentially ties into that shorter time to recurrence uh, that we uh, that exists for IDH wild type tumors, uh, that that limits the opportunity of a hypermutant clone to outgrow other clones in that tumor. We also found that IDH mutant non-codels have a higher frequency of hypermutation than the codels, but I think this is due to the fact that we have a relatively small IDH mutant codel cohort. And in fact, preliminary data that I'm not able to show here, um, but based on, on the basis of, of a larger cohort of IDH mutant codels has shown that actually the frequency of um, hypermutation is comparable between the non-codels and the codels. Now, we then looked at survival, uh, first time to progression on the left, and then survival after recurrence on the right, and found that time to progression is comparable between hypermutators and non-hypermutators. So the hypermutator phenotype in itself does not immediately drive a more competitive clone, at least not in the window of treatment. But post-recurrence, the hypermutators do worse than the non-hypermutators. So um, this, first of all, suggests that we should not stop treating patients with uh, temozolomide because, you know, there's plenty of clinical trials that will tell you that temozolomide treatment uh, confers a, a survival advantage for this patient population. But it also shows that hypermutation in itself is not a is a is a bad thing, and that hypermutation will drive a more aggressive clone um, that leads to uh, shortened survival post recurrence. And we published this find these findings and, and and many other findings in 2019. We then turned to the other mainstay of therapy for glioma patients, with it, which is radiation, and this is an analysis led by Emre Kachagabuk and Kevin Anderson. Emra is a, now a medical resident in Germany, and Kevin is a postdoc in the lab. Um, so radiation is used for treatment of the majority of patients with the glioma and causes, amongst others, double strand breaks. And like the, like the temozolomide-induced DNA damage, cells have mechanisms for repairing double-stranded uh, double break DNA damage. And as a consequence, this collateral DNA damage may accumulate in glioma cells. And combined, this then causes radiation to increase the odds of cell death. So we evaluated the impact of radiation on point mutations, uh, insertions, and deletions. So point, these are slightly different categories of um, DNA damage. So we first looked at point mutations, and, um, and this is an analysis of just untreated cases. So none of these gliomas received uh, uh, radiation. And even amongst non-irradiated um, uh, tumors, we see that there's an increase in the number of newly acquired mutations. So the difference between the pretreatment tumor, the difference in the frequency of mutations between the pretreatment and the, in this case, the post-recurrence uh, tumor. Um, there are, of course, and, and this is, of course, uh, the subset of cases that has received, uh, that has uh, undergone hypermutation as a result of, tomos, of tamazolamide. So untreated in this uh, figure means not, uh, means untreated with radiation. We then looked at uh, cases that did receive radiation um, and counted the number of mutations pre and post treatment and found that there's some increase. Uh, but at the same time, this increase was not significantly different from cases that did not receive radiation. So re radiation in itself apparently does not really change the frequency of point mutations. We then looked at a second category of mutations, namely small 20 to uh, 2 to 20 base pair insertions and found a similar um, pattern that there's an increase in the number of uh, small insertions, um, but that this increase in the number of small insertions in itself is not affected by radiation. And then finally, we looked at, uh, we looked at small deletions, small 22 to 20 base pair deletions. And again, found that in untreated cases, there is an, an increase in the number of small deletions, 
But as you can hopefully uh, appreciate here, the number of small deletions is significantly higher amongst cases that receive radiation. So irradiated pleomas acquired significantly more small deletions in comparison to untreated uh, gliomas. Now, I've shown you that hypermutation is a relatively frequent phenomenon uh, amongst gliomas, especially uh, those treated with tamazolamide. So we asked the question, does uh, this, uh, this hypermutation in itself drive, is, is the increase in small deletions a result of hypermutation? So we did, in, and we did find that amongst hypermutant cases, so these are hypermutated cases only, there's a significant increase in the number of small deletions. Um, but this is, and, and that this is true for both untreated and treated with radiation tumors. So hypermutation also drives a small deletion phenotype independent from, uh, from irradiation. But when looking at only non-hypermutators, we still find a very significant increase in the number of small deletions. Um, and in fact, when we do a multivariate analysis, we find that both hypermutation and radiation independent of one another drive the formation or are associated with a significantly higher small deletion increase. We then turn to the Hardwick Medical Foundation database, which is a database of whole genome sequencing data from over 5,000 metastatic tumors. And this data and this very large cohort includes nearly 1,000 post-radiation therapy tumors. So this is a little different from the Cancer Genome Atlas. The Cancer Genome Atlas has characterized untreated, newly diagnosed tumors. Hardwick is entirely focused on metastatic tumors, so, and many of those uh, are, for that reason, are post-treatment, including many being post-radiation. Uh, a limitation, which is by design, is of course that these are single time, time point tumors and we're not, excuse me, we're not able to compare pre and post-treatment tumors. Um, we separated this uh, Hardwick Medical Foundation cohort, uh, which is, uh, uh, by the way, an institution um, uh, from the Netherlands and, so, and these are all Dutch patients. Uh, we separated this cohort of more than 5,000 single time point cases, first by cancer type, and then further into three groups, tumors that did not receive radiation, tumors that were palliatively irradiated, and tumors that were curatively irradiated. So palliative radiation, uh, of course, is mostly intended to reduce pain. Um, and then, as I said, the third group is curative, so irradiation with the intent to cure. Now, an, another limitation of Hartwig, um, which in itself is an absolutely phenomenal data set, um, so I'm, I'm not trying to be negative, of course, but it is a limitation of the data set that we don't know exactly what part of the body was treated with radiation. We don't know if the original site of the tumor was irradiated, whether it was the metastatic tumor that was irradiated or the lymph node. Um, so there's presumably a little bit of a lack of a loss of signal there, if there is any. Um, and of course, the, 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 uh, the fact that it's single time, but means we can't really do pre and post treatment tumors comparison. So with those drawbacks in mind, I think it's even more astonishing that we were able to validate our findings uh, across this cohort. So if you look at not in all tumor types, but in many tumor types, and in particular ones with larger numbers, like the sarcomas, the breast cancers, the lung cancers, the prostate cancers, we see a significant increase in the in the burden of small deletions for patients that are palliatively treated with radiation compared to untreated tumors, and a further increase in cases that receive curative treatment. So it's a nice stepwise increase in the number of small deletions, which you know absolutely validates our findings in our glioma cohort. Um, as you may know, uh, in part because the Sanger Institute is, a, is, a, is of course a leading driver of this, um, this concept, you can deconvolute all mutations detected across a cancer genome into specific signatures. There, and if you go to this URL uh, from the Sanger, there's um, a description of 94 different signatures based on point mutations, as well as 18 signatures based on... Oh, uh, see and the one, 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 there. Yeah. Good. Good work with the show. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I'm hearing some somebody else talking. Maybe you can try to mute your microphone. 
Um, so uh, we use this approach, and, and, and it's, it's good to, re to recognize that these signatures can then be tied to particular processes that can be endogenous or exogenous. For example, signature one is, in, is related in, in, to aging, signature two is related to apoback activity, signature four is related to DNA damage repair, and so on and so forth. So we projected those signatures both on the glass longitudinal data, looking at only acquired mutations. So mutations that were not present in the primary tumor, but were found in the recurrence only. And, and we looked uh, and we projected signatures on the Harbick single time point data sets. And when we did this, we found uh, and when we looked at uh, radiotherapy treated tumors that were not hypermutated uh, in contrast to the hypermutators, um, we saw a significant um, uh, enrichment in these radial plots for a signature 13. So this is a point mutation driven signature. And we see an enrichment in signature 13 in post-radiation uh, tumor. And we find the same signature 13 to be enriched together with signature 2 um, in irradiated Hardwick tumors. Um, in the Hardwick tumors, we took out uh, cases enriched for MSI and cases uh, enriched for homologous uh, recombination deficiency uh, to fine-tune the analysis. So we see that post-irradiation tumors have an enrichment for uh, uh, point mutation signature 2 and point mutation signature 13. And those are both APOBEC activity signatures. And APOBEC, you may recognize, you may know this, uh, is a enzyme that uh, tries to damage effectively a single-stranded DNA. So you could picture a model in which radiation causes a double-strand break that causes the existence of single-strand breaks. Um, APOBEC acts on those. Uh, then the DNA damage repair process comes in, uh, connects the uh, loose ends again, and now you've got enrichment around the breakpoints um, uh, for these uh, uh, that are APOBEC uh, associated. We then looked at insertion deletions or indel signatures um, and found an enrichment for uh, signature 8 in both the glass longitudinal data and the Hartwick single time point data. Um, and Signature 8, it's not precisely, the, the uh, driving process is not precisely defined, uh, but it, by and large, is a, it reflects non-homologous end joining, which I think is by far the most common type of um, uh, uh, double strand break repair that we see across cancer, uh, and also here associated with, with uh, repair of uh, radiation-induced uh, strand breaks. We then evaluated whether radiation affects aneuploidy, which are broad losses and gains. And aneuploidies are, have a very different uh, genesis process compared to double strand breaks and typically happens as a result of segregation errors during mitosis. So aneuploidies are broad chromosome level or chromosome arm level losses and gains. And found that uh, when we compared first um, untreated primary two recurrences and we looked at gains only, we found that there's really no um, uh, increase in the number of broad gains in untreated radi uh, in radiation untreated tumors between the primary and the recurrence. And when we looked at treated tumors, we also didn't really, we did not see any difference in the frequency of broad gains. But when we looked at losses, we saw a significant increase in the frequency in the, in, in the frequency of broad common number losses for irradiated tumors, which we did not uh, find an untreated tumor. So radiation apparently not just drives small deletions, but also causes segregation errors leading to loss of, uh, of uh, chromosomes and chromosome arms. Now, another thing we noticed is that it had been reported in literature also by ourselves uh, that um, uh, in IDH mutant tumors, you can frequently find homozygous deletions of the CDKN tumor suppressor at recurrence. So at diagnosis, the frequency of loss of CDKN2A in, amongst IDH mutant tumors is pretty rare. So about 2% of, of IDH mutants has a, has a loss of CDKN2A. But at recurrence, this is as high as 30%. Um, by the way, amongst IDH wild type tumors, CDKN2A is very frequently lost in more than 60 to 70% of cases. So this analysis is just focused on IDH mutants. And what we notice is that only amongst radiation-treated tumors, we would see an, an acquired loss of CDKN2A. So there's a convergence here where um, radiation apparently coincides with loss of CDKN2A and an increase in the number of broad losses. 
Now, CDK NTA is a cell cycle regulator, so there's some hints there about what that, or, uh, some mechanistic clues there, what, what is exa exactly going on. We then turn to the heart pick data again, uh, separating the, the, the cohort again into untreated tumors, palliatively treated tumors, and curatively treated tumors. And then counted the number of chromosome losses between uh, cases that had lost CDKN2A and cases that had not lost CDKN2A, so wild types. And as you can see, amongst all three groups, uh, there's not really, there's a significant difference in the uh, in the cases that have lost CKN2A. So another way of explaining this I mean, that may be more clear to you is that it's taking the same data set but now splitting it by cases with loss of homozygous deletion, uh, loss of CKN2A versus cases that are wild type. And to show you that really there's a there is an increase in the frequency of whole chromosome or whole chromosome arm deletions that's in fact related to loss of CDKN2A and not so much with radiation. So we think there's, there's the, 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 the increase in broad deletions we see in our glioma cohort is in fact tied in with the acquired loss of CDKN2A. So there's a stepwise process. First CDKN2A gets lost under the influence of radiation. And then we see a loss of aneuploidies. And then we see an increase in, in, in broad losses. And then finally, um, uh, we uh, looked at uh, outcomes and uh, found that amongst IDH mutant gliomas, when we split that cohort into three groups on the basis of increased small deletion burden. Uh, so with, with we, and if I go to the next slide, I actually have a, a legend there for this. So we see that those cases that have the highest number of uh, newly acquired small deletions has worse outcomes. And this is true for overall survival and time of, time of diagnosis, for post-recurrent survival, but not really for surgical interval. And this work was published uh, earlier this year in Nature Genetics. So the, um, those cases with the highest number of small deletions um, have worse outcomes. And when we turn to the Hartwick data, and we validated this result in a multivariate analysis considering tumor type, we also see that those cases that have the highest number of small deletions, of course, we can't look at acquired small deletions. We can only use the total burden here. Um, but still, that, so that set of tumors with the highest number of small deletions has worst outcomes. So we validated this finding. So we then, um, so then this is sort of the model here. We have a cell of origin. Uh, that's polyclonal at time of diagnosis. A therapeutic barrier is imposed that removes many of the tumor cells. Um, then there are cancer cells that are able to repair the damage of radiation. In fact, the same is true for cancer cells that are able to repair the damage of temozolomide in the case of glioma. And, and those cancer cells will acquire a particular genomic pattern like small deletions or hypermutation. And then they outgrow other cells. And that step is essential because if they don't outgrow the other cells, we, these clones aren't large enough to be detected through sequencing. So there's a step of clonal outgrowth there that you know, ties back into um, Peter Nowell's 1976 uh, proposal of tumor evolution. So to summarize what we've learned so far of the impact of treatment on genetic profiles in IDH wild type tumors, and, and these figures are made by Kevin Johnson, is that among IDH wild types, you know, about 30% of tumors that receives treatment will recur with some genetic effect that imply, implies that there's clonal outgrowth growth of, a, of a more resistant uh, cancer clone. And when we do the same analysis for IDH mutants, which is a bit more complicated because not all tumors receive the same treatment, but we see that maybe around 70 to 75% of tumors recurs with either an outgrown hypermutated clone or an outgrown small deletion clone. Um, and when you evaluate survival for these three groups, you see, as you know, I think is logical given the earlier survival plots I've shown, that those clones that have these acquired um, genomic phenomena have worse outcomes, especially amongst IDH mutants. IDH wild types all do bad, so that's a harder case to make. But it does beg the question, especially for the IGDH wild types, what's going on in this blue group here that does not have clonal outgrowth, 
but still has very poor outcomes. So what's driving the progression in those cases? And I would like to spend my last few slides on going some to some, through some of our observations there. So in an attempt to evaluate non-genetic evolution, we established our own single cell RNA seq data set from a number of um, IDH wild type and uh, IDH mutant tumors. And this is an analysis led by Kevin Johnson and Kevin Anderson and published uh, just a few months ago. Um, in fact, the focus of this analysis was not so much on the single cell transcriptomics, but it was on single cell DNA methylation, but I'm gonna uh, not touch uh, on that for now. Um, we used this cohort of uh, single cell glioma data sets to identify a number of malignant cell states, in particular um, stem-like cells, proliferating stem-like cells and differentiated stem-like cells, as well as a number of non-malignant tumor microenvironment cell states like oligodendrocytes, myeloid cells, and so on and so forth. So we derived 11 in total, 11 gene signatures for these 11 cell states. And we then used a tool called CyberSort X, but there's many similar tools uh, nowadays, to deconvolute bulk RNA sequencing profiles on the basis of those 11 signatures, basically to count the relative presence of each of those 11 signatures, each of those 11 cell states in a given bulk tumor profile. Um, and this is work led by Fred Varn, who is a postdoctoral fellow in the lab. So when we did this, um, when we projected these 11 cell states, these 11 gene signatures on the GLASS data set, and then in particular, the IDH wild type tumors, uh, we can deconvolute the entire cohort into these cell states. Um, we see that there's a relatively high presence of myeloid cells uh, in the tumor microenvironment. This is very well known and very well described for gliomas. Um, and we noticed that uh, at recurrence, there's a significantly higher proportion of oligodendrocytes in IDH wild type tumors. And perhaps you could reason that this is because the surgeon is even more aggressive in removing as much of the tumor uh, at that time as possible, maybe, um, or the tumor has grown even more infiltratively, so there's more of a mixture of tumor cells and, and you know, white matter, um, which would be the source for oligodendrocytes. Um, we can now use the same computational methodology, CyberSort X, to evaluate gene expression profiles of these cell states in these bulk tumors. So we used, we did this for IDH wild type gliomas. We compared the differentiated like cell state at diagnosis and primary tumors to the gene expression profile of differentiated like cells in recurrent IDH wild type gliomas. And when we did this and then did a, a um, gene set enrichment analysis, we find that these signatures, in particular the differentiated like signature and the stem like signature, um, acquire uh, uh, gene set activities that all relate to neuronal signal signaling. So I think this is an important concept. So we were able to evaluate the malignant cell profiles, but in the malignant cells, we see an activation of neuronal signaling at recurrence. And we see that this activation of neuronal signaling coincides with an increased frequency of oligodendrocytes. So this then raises the question, does the exposure to oligodendrocytes cause an increase in neuronal signaling in these tumor cells? And does that imply extensive interaction between glioma cells, in this case, IDH wild type glioma cells, and cells in the microenvironment? So in order to validate uh, these observations, we first reanalyzed a public data set from you et al, uh, which who did multi-biopsy single cell RNA sequencing on nine patients. So they ob obtained tumor samples from different parts of the tumor uh, with annotation of where these specimens were obtained relative to the core of the tumor. Um, and when we then compared specimens that were classified as being from the rim, the perimeter of the tumor, versus specimens that were obtained from the core of the tumor, we see that among specimens obtained from the rim, there's a much higher activity of these same neuronal signatures, validating what we saw in our bulk, um, in our bulk analysis of class. And when we performed uh, uh, immunofluorescence uh, on a number of our specimens uh, where for which we had FFP samples, and, and we did immunofluorescence using DEPI stains to color nuclei, SOX2 to color uh, glioma cells, and then 
um, NDUN to the to color um, neuronal cells, and then finally SNP25 to color those cells with increased activity, those glioma cells with increased activity um, of uh, neuronal activity. We see that in regions of cellular tumor, which are typically more towards the center of the tumor, there's not as much SNP25 activity. Um, but when we look at the infiltrating area of the tumor, we see very high activity of SNP25. We see that it co-occurs with SOX2, but not with NEUN. Uh, so again, this validates the observation that uh, apparently the exposure to, neuro uh, to oligodendrocytes coincides with an increased activity of neuronal uh, signaling in IDH wild type tumors. And we made similar observations, and I won't have time to talk about those now, um, with respect to myeloid cells. So what does that then mean? Um, uh, actually, I, I skipped this part, so I'm going to skip it in the summary part two. So just to focus on, um, uh, sorry, just to focus on IDH wild type tumors first, and uh, is that we see an impact, uh, we see a genetic evolution in gliomas under the impact of temozolomide and radiation. This genetic evolution is more frequent amongst IDH mutants than it is on, amongst IDH wild types. We then also now are starting to uncover non-genetic evolution, non-genetic mechanisms that are shaped through interactions with cells in the tumor microenvironment, which I think are very interesting and very exciting and, and touches upon an, a new and rising field called cancer neuroscience. Um, and finally, and I didn't really talk about this either. This is a, a summary slide I used from a different talk where I did talk about extra chromosomal DNA. Um, but suffice to say that my lab is also very interested in extra chromosomal DNA amplifications and that they, these provide another mechanism to enable rapid, rapid adaptation to stress conditions. So um, I'll close there. And of course, uh, with acknowledgement to the people in the lab who do all the hard work. Um, you know, Fred, uh, whose paper, by the way, is on BioArchive did a phenomenal job in, in analysis of the RNA sequencing data from GLASS, and, and we hope to, pu to publish that manuscript very soon. Um, but helped with all the lab members shown here in this nice picture from the recent Society for Neuro-Oncology meeting, uh, which took place in Boston, where we all went all together. Um, and it was really a pleasure, of course, to be at an in-person meeting again. And uh, by the looks of it, that will be the last in-person meeting for quite a while. Uh, so I'm glad, I'm glad we had that opportunity, opportunity to take that picture there. Um, and then, of course, all the funding agencies, and I'm happy to take questions. Okay, thank you. Um, that was a really interesting talk. I'm just trying to start up my video, if possible. Oh. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, while we wait for questions to come in, I've got um, a quick one. I was very interested, especially by the data you showed at the end, um, showing the increase in this neuronal signature um, in association with an increase in oligodendrocytes in the samples, which is really in line with what we've recently shown with increased oligodendrocyte differentiation within the white matter. Um, and I guess like this increase in like, the neuronal signature is also associated with increased differentiation. So it could be the same thing that you're seeing now. Yeah, I think that's very right. I think we're, yeah, we're, we're not the only ones making these observations. Of course, there's a lot of work by Frank Winkler and Michelle Monge, yeah. Dave Gutman, uh, and, uh, and also in pediatric gliomas um, that are all sort of pointing us in the same direction. And the, um, the new and exciting technology that I think everybody is excited about is spatial transcriptomics. And I think that's gonna, uh, you know, shows a lot of new insights once it's really ready to do single cell analysis, which right now mm -hmm. it isn't. Um, but, but once single cell transcriptomics is able to really do single cell based profiling, we're going to learn an incredible amount. And I'm very excited about that, uh, about the opportunities there. And at the same time, it's, it's, it continues to be disheartening that you can learn so much about these tumors and you can you know, increase your knowledge base every time. But in the end, we have to ask ourselves the questions, what does it mean for the patient? And right now yeah. the answer is nothing. And you know, that, that's certainly the, the thing we have to keep in mind. Um, you know, molecular profiling is great, but it doesn't really benefit the patient unless we go beyond it. And so that's certainly something we also try to do. In that respect, do you think that any of your recent findings, in particular with the um, CDK and 2A uh, 
deletion, acquisition of CDK and N2A deletion could be applied therapeutically or could be used to inform therapeutics? Well, one direction that that would go into is the use of um, cell cycle inhibitors, right? Or, mm. um, uh, like, or, or like the we one kinase inhibitors that are you know, being evaluated. And um, uh, you know, there's a few others like that to determine in cases that, for example, acquire these CD cancer deletions, whether those will be more sensitive to that type of approach. Um, uh, that, those, so those are clinical trials that I know exist and are ongoing. I'd be curious to see. I hope that evaluating the status of CD cancer a will be considered as a biomarker there, because I think that could be all the, make all the difference. Mm. Um, there's not any, I'm not sure if I can see if anyone's got their hand up or not, but um, there's nothing in the chat so far. Um, I have another question. <laughs> so do you see any association between these small deletions um, and molecular subtype in the tumors that you've looked at? Um, yes, in the sense that, um, again, again, the IDH wild types recur much quicker than IDH mutants. And for that reason, um, there's more opportunity for IDH mutants to develop these types of phenomena. And um, sorry, I was going to say in, in the, sorry, in the wild type ones, in terms of, um, proneural, classical, mesenchymal. All right. The other, the other subtypes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I don't think we do, and I don't think we've looked at it in that much detail. You know, there's about, in our current cohort, there's, there's about 30 or so tumors that acquire a significant number of small deletions, and I don't think we've split them amongst the IDH wild types by subtype uh, yet. Okay. Um, I can see Jamie has his hand up. Did you want to ask a question, Jamie? Hi, Rob. Thanks for a, a really great talk. Um, so I had a, a question that kind of related to a, a point I think you were just just making about the IDH mutant tumors have have more time to acquire th these things. Have you also looked at uh, like putting rates on these things as well as just like the level of mutational burden to see whether the kind of rates of accumulation of these things differ between the, the different types? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. You know, and, and and these are the types of nuances that I skipped over, but not all our tumors in our cohort are strictly a primary and a first recurrence. In fact, we have uh, primary and second recurrence, or in some cases we have the first and the third recurrence. And then of course, there's the age of the patient that presumably could also make a difference. And right now we have about a hundred um, IDH uh, mutant gliomas. And I think once you start considering those factors, the, 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 the subsets, get too small to do a, mean, a very meaningful analysis. But at the same time, uh, I anticipate that these numbers are gonna increase. You know, We have more than 250 IDH mutant gliomas that have already been sequenced that are going to be added to this cohort in the near future. Um, and you know, once we get to those types of numbers, I think these are analyses that, that we, can, we can do. I also wanna reiterate, all the data is public right now. There's no, maybe you have data we're still working on validating and QCing, and that's why it's not part of this release yet. But you know, these nearly 300 patients are public, and I hope you and many others will use those for, for these types of analysis. Great, and no, it sounds really exciting. And yeah, thanks, we are, we are making a lot of use of public data, so thanks to people like you. Do you mind if I ask one other uh, very quick one? Um, with your, you showed um, in the IDH mutant patients this difference in survival when you look at patients with these kind of genomic scars of tumazolamide and, and radiation. Have you have you done a, a multivariable analysis, including clinical factors, to try and work out whether this is like a biological effect on survival or just confounded by the fact that these are like more aggressive tumors that are getting more more treatment? Yeah, that's a very sort of chicken and egg question almost. Um, uh, we, we considered factors like age uh, and um, I forget if we did KPS, uh, Konofsky score uh, as well, but we certainly looked at age, which is commonly a very potent uh, predictor of survival and, it, and they go beyond, so they're independent from age, for example. Okay. So I am comfortable stating that I think they are truly uh, um, 
create that, that these genetic scars mark clones that are more aggressive. I think I'm, I'm pretty comfortable saying that. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I don't think there's any more questions, and I think we're about exactly on time now. So thank you so much for. Oh, is there? In the chat. Oh. Uh, let me see if I can open that one. Okay. Read the question. Yeah. Yeah, from... so these mutations are potentially actionable. So that's a, a good question, but also a difficult question because many of the mutations that are actionable, that we know are actionable in other tumor types like EGFR mutation and lung cancer. Uh, you know, these mutations are already very frequent in primary glioblastoma, and we've known that forever. Um, but there's been plenty of clinical trials that have made, that have not, that have been, um, that have shown that targeting EGFR in, in, in glioblastomas for whatever reason doesn't make a difference in outcomes. Um, so in the, in, amongst the, the landscape of newly acquired mutations, you know, there's, you know, for example, the CKN2A inhibitor, we can only hear, uh, we can only hope that, uh, you know, in, uh, including a cell cycle a, a targeting agent could confer some kind of survival benefit, but we don't know that yet. Okay, so I think that, is it now for questions, unless anyone wants to pop in last minute? If not, um, thank you so much, Roel, for the talk. It was incredibly interesting. Um, and thank you, Michelle, for organizing everything. The uh, Just a comment, sorry, there's one more. Oh, great talk. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, the next month, or in January, we've got another um, talk again on the subject of glioma from Frank Finari. And I've just uh, emailed the link to that talk. Uh, Put the link to that talk in the chat if anyone's interested. Thanks, Lucy, for organizing, and thanks, everyone. Nice to see some friends here as well. Thanks. See you. Bye.